You are my hero, you are my superstar, my God in life, you are my everything, you are Muhammad, peace be upon him. Brothers and sisters, I want to thank everyone again, just like every week. This is the third week. I want to thank everyone once again for tuning in. And uh, this is your time at the end of the day, and you can choose whatever you want to do. But yet, you wake up in the morning and you join our gathering here. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept this very action. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make it easy. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us uh, proper learners of the deen and also to propagate and whatever we learn we should make the intention of passing it on to others inshallah alhamdulillah rabbil alameen was salatu was salam wa sallimu ala rasulihi al-kareem amma ba'd faqad qala allah ta'ala fi al-quran al-majid ba'da a'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan al-rajim bismillahi ar-rahman ar-rahim wa ma arsalnaka illa rahmatan lil alameen so last week, we discussed about the geography of the Arabian Peninsula. And a few points were made in regards to the geography of the Arabian Peninsula. Uh, we came to learn about the desert life, the tribal life, um, how they would move from one place to another, how they would host guests who, who come to their homes um, also, we discussed about uh, the lineage of the people of the Arabian Peninsula and how much value they gave to the lineage. And then towards the end of the program, I did mention about Ismail alayhi salam. Uh, Ibrahim alayhi salam had two sons and uh, one of them was Ismail alayhi salam. Ishmael in the English term. And then we have Ishaq alayhi salam in the English term Isaac. <clears throat> so Ibrahim alayhi salam had these two sons. And then it's broadly accepted that Ismail alayhi salam, he is the pendant of the Arab lineage. Right? He's, the, he's, uh, he's the first of the Arab lineage. That's where all the Arabs come from. But at the same time, the reality and the truth is, even though he is the first, you cannot deny the, the, the tribes and, and, and the nations that lived before Ismail alayhi salam. So you would have to consider them Arab as well. Okay. So those are like the likeness of Ad mentioned in the Quran, the people of Ad, uh, the people of, of Samud. Um, and, and many other tribes, like we mentioned, uh, the Sabians, where Allah Ta'ala says, the people of Saba. Allah Ta'ala talks about the Sabians living in the area of Yemen. Okay? So you have these nations and these tribes who came before Ismail alayhi salam. So they were also Arab. But at the same time, we have to accept that Ismail alayhi salam, he is one of the high esteem individual in the Arab lineage. And this is the reason why they kept him as uh, to give him that much value. <clears throat> and of course, at the same time, to note down that he came from what? A Ibrahim alayhi salam. And we know Ibrahim alayhi salam, he was, a, he, he was a noble face upon this very earth to every religion and also no religions. If, you, if, if there's people who don't follow any religion, e even according to them, Ibrahim alayhi salam, he was a very noble individual, a, a very noble person. So marking that Ismail alayhi salam also holds that much of value. So Ibrahim, uh, Ismail alayhi salam, also being the son and also being a prophet. So you have to remember that. You have to consider all of, all of those other credentials that... Uh, Ibrahim alayhi salam had and also uh, to his son Ismail alayhi salam so once again Ismail alayhi salam is one of the pendants of the Arab lineage and this is the reason why we have to consider him uh, so 
onwards, we will be discussing today. So since we have three sessions left, in today's session, we're going to learn the, the family of the Prophet ﷺ. And very quickly, we're going to move on to the initial stages of the Prophet ﷺ's life. Uh, pretty much, you know, a summarized version in what happened in Mecca. And our next session, we're going to discuss the migration of the Prophet ﷺ, when he migrated from Mecca to Medina. In our last session, we're going to discuss about the life of Medina uh, before the Prophet ﷺ passed away. So this is our plan for the next three sessions, including today. So inshallah, today's uh, discussion, we're going to be starting off with the initial stages of the life of the Prophet ﷺ. So one of the things to note down is that when you go through generations after generations after generations, this is from Ismail alayhi salam, I'm not going to mention all those generations. It's very, very detailed and very lengthy. But one of the high esteemed and, and, and respected individual in the lineage of Ismail alayhi salam and before the Quraysh was his name was the uh, by the name of Adnan, right? A D N A N. So you can you can write that down. So Adnan was a very can you spell that again? Great great ancestor. He was a great ancestor. It is agreed fact that Adnan was descended from Ismail alayhi salam, and this is from different different narrations and different different authorities that confirm this. So from him comes the, the Quraysh lineage and, and other, other uh, tribes from, uh, from Adnan. See, when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, before he even came uh, to this very earth, before he was born, there was a lot of discussion, a lot of conversations in which the Jewish people of Yemen. Now, there was a time where people lived in Yemen who were Jewish. Okay, so you should note that down. There were Christians living in Yemen. See, Yemen was a very important place in the Arabian Peninsula. Right? That's that's the first fact. The second fact is that the we would we would call them the the Yemenis. Okay, Yemenis are. Um, as the book says, other names for the Yemeni people, we'll just call them Yemenis uh, so that we can understand they're from Yemen. So if you were from Yemen at that time, it should be notable that you could have been an idol worshiper or you could have been a Jewish person or you could have been a Christian person, right? On Christianity. Now, in their books, such as the Injil, the Torah, they gave hints and indication towards a prophet coming. So the conversations and discussions will always happen. And you know, you see how like one word passes on to another, right? Words pass around a lot. Stories pass around a lot. So the words of a prophet coming spread out very quickly. And it so happened that it didn't spread out from just, just from the Yemenis, but it also spread out in Mecca. It's also spread out in Medina and all around the Arabian Peninsula. And some of the narrations also point out that the words of a prophet coming, the word of a prophet coming, it was also highlighted and talked about even in the outside part of the world, outside of the Arabian Peninsula. So the people, they would come all the time and they would come to Mecca and these people, they would say, you know, a great prophet will be coming in this, in this part, in this lineage. Now, you have the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's grandfather by the name of uh, Abdul Muttalib, right? Abdul Muttalib. Now, he had a son, he had few sons, but his second son was the father of the Prophet ﷺ. His second son was the father of the Prophet ﷺ. Again, I want to remind everyone, in-house uh, rules, 
that um, be respectful. Um, don't uh, ask questions right in the middle of uh, the program. And also, most of all, write down notes and pay attention, inshallah. So the second son of Abdul Muttalib was by the name of Abdullah. Okay, Abdullah. And this was the father of our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Now, a lot of glad tidings and, not, and a lot of indications would come to Abdul Muttalib that a, a, a very great person, a very great individual will be born into your lineage, into your family. So Abdul Muttalib, the grandfather of the Prophet Sallallahu he said that, you know what, it, a lot of people are giving me these glad tidings and these indications. So I must preserve uh, my lineage. I need to keep them protected. So this is the reason why he found Abdullah, the, the father of the Prophet uh, He protected him and he wanted him to get married. So he took him, he took Abdullah and Abdullah, the father of the Prophet to few places in, uh, for marriage. And then we know the mother of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was by the name of who? Amin. We should write that down. His mother's name, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's mother's name was Amina. <clears throat> so thereafter, uh, Abdul Muttalib, Abdul Muttalib, the grandfather of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he took his son Abdullah and he contracted the marriage between his son Abdullah for who? For Amina. And there were other individuals there on this very contract of marriage. Now, there were times where there were other individuals, other females who wanted to marry Abdullah, but because of the, in, the indications and the hints and, the, uh, and, and what the Jewish individuals, the rabbis and also the Christian uh, priests and pastors, whatever you want to call them, they would come to who? They would come to Abdul Muttalib and to come to the lineage of Quraysh and tell them about a specialty in their lineage that such and such person will be coming. And this is the reason why Abdul Muttalib wanted to preserve that. And he wanted, he wanted Abdul Muttalib to, to get married. Uh, he wanted his son Abdullah to get married to a very noble woman. And that was Amina. And this is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted this. He, he wanted our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to be born from a noble family and, and, and noble traits. And this is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has chosen Abdullah as the father of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and also who? Uh, Amina as the mother of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Now the lane, there are lengthy narrations and in, 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 in the marriages, but I'm, I'm going to skip that very quickly. Uh, but we just wanted to give, get the gist of it. So you have Abdullah, the father of the Prophet Sallallahu again. So you can note this down. And the mother of the Prophet Sallallahu is Amina. After the birth of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, by the way, before the birth of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, as the narration mentions, there are other statements also that uh, um, his father, the Prophet Sallallahu's father, uh, he went on a trip and business trip to uh, Syria. Um, so upon doing business over there and handling whatever he had to handle while he was coming back, uh, he, he came to Medina. Uh, when he came to Medina, he fell ill. Okay, so he fell ill. He got sick, in other words. And because of this sickness, he passed away. And uh, the news was actually received uh, by the people of Makkah and Abdul Muttalib also received this news that his son passed away. So Abdul Muttalib, since Abdullah was his second son, the first son mean, uh, by the name of Haris, by the name of Haris, Abdul Muttalib, the grandfather of the Prophet ﷺ, sent his first son Haris to Medina to check up on his second son Abdullah, meaning the father of the Prophet ﷺ to check up on him. But by the time he reached there, he, he already found out well, because back in those days, they did not have phones. They did not have text messaging. They didn't have internet. They didn't have none of that. So you had to travel for days to find out a, a, about a news. So by the time he reached there, he, he already had found out that his brother Abdullah has passed away. So we come to know here that this is one of the 
highest point uh, of being an orphan. Okay, this is the highest point of being an orphan. Now, there's an Islamic rule here, right? When would you consider, when would you consider uh, a child to be an orphan? Okay, when will you consider a child being an orphan? So the general rule is that when you consider uh, an orphan, an orphan is when they lose their father. Okay, when they lose their father. And some, in some narrations it comes, uh, this, since this is about fiqh, um, they say, some of the imams, they say that when you lose your mother, that's when you know that you're an orphan. Or when you lose both of them. So no matter which narration and which uh, view you look at, it's pretty much all around the same. But now, why I'm mentioning this is because a child becomes an orphan when he or she loses either the father or the mother or both of them. But in this case of the Prophet wasallam, he lost his father before he was born. Now, just imagine that, right? He didn't even get to meet his father. He did not even get to meet his father. So this is the highest point in what? This is the highest point of being an orphan. Like you losing your parents or one of your parents before you even come into this very world. So the Prophet ﷺ came into this world not knowing his father, not, not meeting his father, subhanAllah. Right? So you'd imagine what the Prophet ﷺ went through. Thereafter, after the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when he was born, before he was born, his mother, his mother had him in, 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 uh, in, in her what? In her belly, in her womb. And she saw a dream. She saw a dream. And this is a narration of Ibn Kathir, rahimahullah. He says that he, his mother saw a dream, uh, a light illuminating in Syria. That's what she saw. She saw palaces of Syria. She saw a lot of indication towards the specialty in the, literally, I would say, a nobility in her, in her carrying the Prophet Sallallahu in her womb, okay? And this was told to her by many, many people who were always used to tell her. Even, even the grandfather, Abdul Muttalib, he, he was given glad tidings so much that Abdul Muttalib would say, he would say, my lineage is blessed. And my lineage became blessed of what? Because of who? Because of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam or someone, to, someone special to be born. So she saw this. So she also went on a trip. She went to travel. But on her way from traveling, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, at that time, uh, she, he was about six years of age. And some narration comes seven, some narration comes eight, but we'll take the six years old. Uh, since this is the majority of the scholars, they, they agree upon this. So at the age of six, upon the traveling that she took, she passed away from this very trip. Now, again, remember the conditions I, I, I mentioned before about being an orphan at a certain age. As long as it's before the maturity age, you're considered an orf orphan if you lose your father, firstly, or your mother or both of them. But here is the Prophet, his father is... Is, is not there when he when he was born. And at the same time, at a very, very tender age of six, guys, just six years of age, the Prophet ﷺ loses his mother. And then no later than that, the Prophet ﷺ loses his grandfather, Abdul Muttalib. And the Prophet ﷺ goes in the custody. And now this is very important, guys. I want you to remember this name. And I know we've definitely heard it before. In, in the maktab, in the Saturday, Sunday class, or whatever Islamic classes that we're taking, uh, we definitely heard these names. This name by the name of Abu Talib. Abu Talib. T-A-L-I-B, if you want to write down the note. Abu Talib. He was the uncle of the Prophet wasallam who took custody of the Prophet wasallam after the demise of who? Of Abdul Muttalib, the grandfather. So the narration shows that he was about 10 or 12 years of age when his uncle took custody of him. Now, his uncle was who? The brother of his father. 
So Abu Talib was the brother of his father. Now, Abu Talib loved the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam so much, even more than his own children. Now, here's the thing. Abu Talib, when it came to wealth, he was not so wealthy. He was not so wealthy. But because of the blessings of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, being in his home, being in his home, the, the blessings and the wealth and the provisions in his own home became what? Became more abundant, subhanAllah. They were, they were always satisfied. They were always situated with satisfaction uh, in, in, in the home when, uh, because of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And this is where we can say uh, where uh, the, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam grew up with some of his cousins like Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu who was his cousin. Now, the other thing to discuss is that the uh, Abu Talib also taught the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He taught the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam what? He taught him business. He taught him everyday life. He taught him how to herd the sheep and the cattle the cows uh, to take out the animals for grazing. He taught him that. You know, there's a hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, which mentions when he was telling the Sahabas that every prophet was a shepherd. Every prophet was a shepherd. So one of the Sahabas, he asked the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that, Ya Rasulullah, was this your position? Was this your job occupation? Two as well, because the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is a prophet. So the Sahaba asked out of curiosity, did, did you do this also? So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says that, yes, I was a shepherd and I, and I, and I took care uh, of, of sheep and, and, and cattle and, and grazing the animals uh, for the Meccans. Okay, so that's something to note down. At the same time, Abu Talib was, used to take the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam on business trips and used to teach him business. Now, as for, as for the name Muhammad, right? As for the name Muhammad, let's go over the name Muhammad. What was so special about uh, the name Muhammad? So the, the speciality of the name Muhammad, as Qadi Iyad, rahimahullah, he says, that no one had the name Ahmad which is mentioned in the heavenly books. Now, this is Ahmed. We have Ahmed in the Quran, in the 28th chapter, chapter of the Quran, in Surah Al-Saf. Min ba'dismuhu Ahmed. Okay. So the word in the name Muhammad has a connection with the name Ahmed. Ahmed means the most praiseworthy. Okay. Muhammad also means praiseworthy the praised. So the link between the two, the root letters, meme, uh, sorry, ha, meme, and dal have an interaction with each other. Ahmed and Muhammad. So you see ha, meme, dal in both these words. So they mean the same thing. Praiseworthy, the all praised. Um, so at the same time, it should be noted that no one was named Muhammad before Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Now, 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 there's a narration. There's a narration which mentions that since the there there were Jewish rabbis and and Christians, they would come and they would have these conversation and discussion about a prophet coming into the lineage of Quraysh and in 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 the entire Mecca area. They would also, some of them also mention the name Muhammad. So because of this, some of the Quraysh, some of the Quraysh families would name their sons Muhammad. But this is just a narration, okay? They would, they would do this only, like it was very close 
before the coming of the Prophet ﷺ, before the birth of the Prophet ﷺ, around that time, some of the Quraysh, they started naming their, who? They started naming their sons Muhammad so they, they can receive this nobility. They can receive this nobility for their sons. But of course, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has chosen our Prophet وسلم, this Prophet, this Muhammad وسلم, to be Muhammad وسلم, right? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. And as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, Wallahu a'lamu haythu yaja'alu risalata. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best where to place his message. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted our prophet, meaning this Muhammad and this very individual, this best of creations to carry his message. So Allah ta'ala knows best where to place his message. So, and he chose Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to do this. Now, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he would go, he was born on, on a Monday. If you want to ask what day the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was born, he was born on a Monday. I want to share with you a very quick narration of Sahih Muslim. That Abu Qatada radiallahu ta'ala anhu says that a village, a village dweller, meaning a villager, asked the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam about fasting on Monday. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, this is the day which I was born, meaning the Monday. And on this day, I was commissioned as a prophet. So the prophethood has been given to me on a Monday, but on a Monday, I was also born. Now, Imam Ahmad, he also says from Ibn Abbas, that the Prophet said, on Monday, the Prophet was born. On Monday, the Prophet was given prophethood. And on this day, he went out of Mecca for Hijrah. And on this day of Monday, he entered Medina. And, and again, it was on Monday in which the Prophet wasallam passed away. Now, we might be thinking that, hey, Friday is a very special day for everything. Yes, but Friday is a special day. Friday has its own virtues. But we should also consider that Mondays also has its own virtues as well. And this is the Prophet wasallam uh, being born on that day. Uh, the narration says passing away on that day, migration on that day, leaving Makkah that day, entering Medina on a Monday. And there's another narration which mentions that the black stone, right? the black stone which was lifted onto the Kaaba was also on a Monday. And we all know the narration about this is that once the, this black stone fell, and they had to reconstruct the Kaaba in some places. And, and the people of Mecca, the different tribes, they started fighting with one another. And they said that I will be, we will be the one placing this black stone because of the nobility, because it's a very noble action. So before, since the argument started so much so, that came up to a decision where they mentioned that the next morning, the following morning, Whoever is the first one to be here will take the decision or his tribe or he will be the one lifting this black stone and putting it up next to the Kaaba. And of course, to your guess, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he was the first individual to be there in the morning. And then he had an idea where he placed uh, his shawl and he placed a black stone there and he made all the tribes pick up this very shawl along with the black stone and next to the Kaaba so that everyone had a share so they could take part in this noble action so no one will, will fight later on. So this, is, this was the nobility of the Prophet Sallallahu and this action was done on a, it was done on a Monday. In some narrations, not all, in some narration it comes that there's a verse in the Quran which is very special. And this verse goes by, الْيَوْمَ أَكْمَلْتُ لَكُمْ دِينَكُمْ That it is on that day, it is on that day that we have completed, this day I have completed and perfected your religion. So Allah Ta'ala is telling the Prophet ﷺ through the verse of the Quran that this is the day I have perfected your religion. And this, this shows that this is towards the ending 
and part of the revelation of the Quran. Okay? So this ayah here was also revealed on a Monday according to some narrations. So according to the majority of the scholars, the Prophet وسلم, was born in the month of Rabi'ul Awwal. Rabi'ul Awwal, we should write this down as a note. The Prophet ﷺ was born on the 18th Rabi'ul Awwal, um, or some say 14th, but whatever the date is, we were, uh, according to the majority of the scholars, it is Rabi'ul Awwal, the month of Rabi'ul Awwal. Uh, how do you spell Rabi'ul Awwal? Um, you can spell it as R A B I U L, and then Awwal as A W W A L. Okay, thank you. Now, you're welcome. So now, while the Prophet ﷺ was brought up, there's some questions. Like, for example, did the Prophet ﷺ ever partake in idol worshipping? Did the Prophet ﷺ ever do the pilgrimage with the people of Mecca? Like, before the, before the revelation and the legislation of Hajj and, and Umrah and all of that? Was there any type of pilgrimage at that time? So there's a lot of questions about that. Did the Prophet engage in those, in those types of actions? So the simple answer is no, he did not. Why? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protected him in every angle. From every point of his life where he was very close or even close to doing any of these things, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protected him from doing so. For example, for example, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Yes, there was a, according to a narration, according to Bay Haki and Ali radiallahu ta'ala reported from his father and, his, and from his father meaning Abdul Muttalib, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that he was never interested in, in singing and, and, and festivals. So on two nights, so this is, except on two nights, this is not a very strong hadith, by the way, but I just wanted to mention it because, because you know, some of us may feel that, hey, sometimes we want to avoid the bad, but sometimes we're in a position where we cannot avoid it, right? For example, if you see something bad happening somewhere and you're walking by it, so somebody might say, hey, I, I think I saw you buy it. Like, I wasn't part of it. Right? I wasn't part of it. So this is some of the narrations which we find that the Prophet ﷺ, he, would, he might probably pass by. So this is an occasion while this happened and both the occasions the Prophet ﷺ was invited for. And, but the Prophet ﷺ, what happened was that he fell asleep and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made it such that he kept sleeping. He missed these two invitations. So this shows that the Prophet ﷺ, he was protected by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Zayd ibn Haritha said that one time, at one time, one of the idol worshippers of Mecca, they touched the idols Isaf and Na'iyah when they went around the Kaaba. So at that time, before Hajj and Umrah, people would circulate around the Kaaba. They would circulate around the Kaaba. So at that time, there was this one idol worshiper who touched two of these idols by the name of Isaf and Ana'iyah. When he touched them, the Prophet ﷺ disallowed him to do so. But he did it a second time. And what happened again, it's to see what happened. And again, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah Allah, Allah's Messenger وسلم, said, Will you not resist? So Zayd bin Haritha, the Sahaba, he confirmed that the Prophet ﷺ never in his life touched the idols, even though he saw it around him. He never went to touch them. So this is how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala refrained him and protected him from idol worshipping or even touching the idols. Now, the Prophet ﷺ in his life, in the initial stages of his life, he went on business trips, like I mentioned before. And that's how he learned how to do business from his uncle. It so happened that at one point of his life, the Prophet ﷺ started doing business and he started working for a very noble woman. 
And this noble woman's name was Khadija radiallahu ta'ala an. Khadija radiallahu ta'ala anha was the wife of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But there's a very special story behind it. Cutting the long story short, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa went on a trip in regards to a very good business. When it, in regards to a very good business. And thereafter, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa was accompanied by the servant of Khadija radiallahu anha by the name of Maisara. Now, Maisara was on this trip with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa where both of them and some other business people, they, they took rest somewhere. And in this area of taking rest, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa he sat under a tree where a monk, right? A monk came to Maisara and told Maisara that this person here under this tree is a very special person, is a very special person. So Maisara started thinking that, okay, this is a very special person. I'm going to see what happens. And after this business trip, she saw the traits of the Prophet ﷺ. She saw the conduct and the akhlaq of the Prophet ﷺ. She saw the manners and the etiquette of the Prophet ﷺ. She saw that the business went very well, that they doubled their profits. And when she came back, she described the Prophet ﷺ to Khadija radiallahu anha. And Khadija radiallahu anha observed the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa and then she sent a proposal to him for marriage. Now, Khadija radiallahu anha had a lot of proposals from many high esteemed people and men uh, from the Quraysh, but she, did, she denied them. And to also note this down, the Khadija radiallahu anha was previously married before. And she was married to she was from a, a royal family. So she married two very high noble families before. But when she saw the Prophet Sallallahu and his ways, she sent a proposal that this is the man that I want to marry and this is the type of man that I want to marry. The Prophet Sallallahu took this very proposal and he took it to his uncle Abu Talib and then he, he, he told him about it. And Abu Talib said, go ahead and, and, and marry this very noble woman for she is a very noble woman and she is from a royal family and she's trustworthy and she, and, and she is a very good businesswoman. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he married Khadija Radiallahu Anha and, she, and, and, and he had how many kids with her? How many children? She had, he had four daughters. He had four daughters with Khadija Radiallahu Anha. And as we all know, the, uh, the daughters of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, I'm pretty sure everyone knows the four daughters of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam by the name of Zainab, Ruqayya, Umm Kulthum, and Fatima, the famous Fatima radiallahu anha. So these are the four. Again, I would name them Zainab, Ruqayya, Umm Kulthum, and Fatima radiallahu anha. And he had two sons with Khadija, Khadija radiallahu anha, but they passed away uh, in a very early stage. According to the majority of the scholars, they passed away at a very early age. And these two sons' names were Tayyib and Tahir. Tayyib and Tahir. So they passed away in a very early stage uh, of their life. And of course, we find Fatima radiallahu anha lived through even the demise of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in Medina. The age of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa upon marrying Khadija radiallahu anha was 25. And according to the scholars, Khadija radiallahu anha was either 35 or 40. Either 35. Ibn Kasir rahimahullah says uh, she was 35. And according to other scholars, they say that she was 40. After this, remember one thing to note down. That after the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa received his revelation. The first revelation, Iqara bismi rabbika alladhi khalaq. Uh, read in the name of your Lord, the one who has created you. Khalaq al-insana min alaq has created human beings from a clot of blood. The first five verses of the Quran revelation was Surah Al-Iqra was revealed to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Now, after receiving this, the very first person to accept Islam was Khadija radiallahu anha. And of course, uh, the children as well. 
And being such a noble face in, in, in Mecca, the Prophet وسلم, was very much loved by everyone. But after receiving this revelation and after, after mentioning and claiming that he was Prophet of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then the negation started happening. So the people, they started what? They started denying him. Right. Most of the people of Makkah, they started rejected, rejecting him. And the very fact that he was trustworthy and he was truthful was not seen by the same eyes anymore. But Khadija radiallahu anha knew that he was a very special man. And Khadija radiallahu anha was the first person to accept Islam. And this is why we find the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, which mentions that there were, there were two people, two females who perfected their iman, who perfected their faith. And he mentions that was Fatima radiallahu anha and also Khadija radiallahu anha. And Khadija radiallahu anha was those individuals, was the first individual to accept Islam and perfect her iman. Even though she never prayed any mandatory salah in her life, she did not pray any, she did not keep any mandatory fast. She did not give any mandatory zakat. She did not perform the mandatory hajj, but yet she perfected her iman. And the reason why she perfected her iman was because of her akhlaq and character and how much she spent money and, and spent money in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Thereafter, because of this, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa along with his tribe, they were boycotted for almost what? One to two years, in some narration, maybe three years. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa especially Meccans and the Quraysh, they started persecuting the Prophet after the demise of his uncle Abu Talib. And even when his uncle Abu Talib passed away, he did not accept Islam, even though the Prophet tried so much. And that's how you know the guidance is ultimately in the, in the hands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And after that, the Quraysh, they took upon this boycott, which boycotted the, the Prophet his family and, and his entire tribe. And this was one of the most hard points of the Prophet Sallallahu life, subhanAllah. They, some of them were even eating grass and whatever was growing in the, in the outskirts of Mecca. They were boycotted. No one can talk to them. No one can do any transaction. No one can give them anything. And it was at that time, SubhanAllah, the Prophet Sallallahu lost Khadija radiAllahu anha. So he lost his father before he was born. He lost his mother when he was about six. He lost his grandfather when he was about 10. And then he lost his two main important people in his life. And that was his uncle Abu Talib and his dear wife Khadija radiallahu anha. Could you imagine the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa after all of this, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa was found to be smiling at the people. Even after all these losses uh, incurred on him. So we learn from the initial stages of the Prophet's life in Mecca. Because of this, eventually through revelation and through wisdom and hikmah, the Prophet eventually had to make the decision to let the initial Muslims who became Muslims, since they were being tortured and, and harmed and, and persecuted, he had to make a plan. And also through the revelation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he had to let them go. Right? Some of them went to uh, Syria. Some of them went to Abyssinia. Some of them went to Medina. And then the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa ultimately had to leave the most dear places to him. And that was his own home, his own hometown, Mecca al mukarrama and before he was leaving, he was saying that, oh, Mecca, you are very dear to me. But because of the inhabitants and because of the people of Mecca, I have to leave today. But of course, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knew that later on the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa would come to, come to Mecca. Because why? The people of Medina were the ones who were accepting the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa to come to their city. Maybe not all of them. We're going to get into details in our later sessions, inshallah. But the people... Open arms were waiting for the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to come to Medina. So inshallah, we will stop here. And uh, in our next discussion, uh, we will be discussing about the migration and the journey of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and how he prepared this journey. And uh, throughout the entire journey, also we're going to discuss the journey. And at the same time, uh, uh, until he reaches Medina, inshallah. So may Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala Give us the ability and the tawfiq 
uh, to look into the seerah and the biography of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and also learn from the biography of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and most of all apply it in our lives. Amin Ya Rabbal Alameen. Jazakumullah Khairan. Thank mm-hmm. you.